Good evening, and thank you so much for joining. We're going to be learning, tonight we're going to be learning the Maimar Mima Makim Kira Sicha Shir HaMailis Mima Makim, which is from the words of Tehillim that we say throughout Aser Simei beginning on Rosh Hashanah. And this Maimar Mima Makim was said by the Baal Tanya on Shabbos, Shuva, Tav Kuf Nun Hei. It's one of the most transformational Maimar I've ever learned. And... For those of you who've read the book, you'll see that a lot of what I've written about, now you'll really see that I didn't make it up, and it's <laughs> really based on the Valtania's work. I just want to preface this with a story. Um, one of my favorite stories, there was a tzaddik, the father of Reb Naftali Rapshitzer, who was known as Reb Nachem Mendel of Lisk. He used to sign all his letters with the name, he write his name, and then underneath his name he would sign um, Yisrael. One time he was signing his name and the ink spilled. So he tried again and another problem happened with his pen or with the paper or something. And, and when it happened a third time, he's like, one second, from Shemayim, they're not letting me sign my name as Oyev Yisrael. What's going on here? So meaning like he realized that something was off. So he, sorry. Second, I'm sorry. So he decided. So he he asked his family, "Did we do something that's not?" You know, he was very distressed. He's like, "One one mitzvah, one thing that I try to do in my life is I try. I pride myself in Avos Yisrael, loving every." person, loving every yid, and treating every person with respect and the dignity that they deserve. And something's off if I'm not able to sign this. So what happened? So he asked his family members what happened. And indeed, somebody came to their house that day to collect money and his family members, or to ask for help, and his family members did not let him into the house. They didn't let him speak to, they didn't let him speak to him. So he's like, okay, I have to find this person. Now, this person was um, a very disliked member of the community. He was known as an informant. He would just, he, he enjoyed getting people into trouble. Um, he, he, he was not a nice person and everybody, you know, he would try to get on people's nerves and he took pleasure in other people's pain and nobody liked him and people stayed away from him. That was the reason why his family members didn't allow him to, to see him because they felt that their father is going to be taken advantage of by this person. Anyways, he searched for him all over the town until he found him in the basement of, I think it was the church or it was the bar, somewhere, not a, not a very respectable place for a nice Jewish boy. And um, he found him. He called him out and he said, how can I help you? I'm so very sorry. You were mistreated. You were disrespected. You were dismissed. You were rejected. You did not deserve to be treated that way. How can I help you? And he, the man told him what he needed from him. He needed help with a certain favor. And the Ayah of Yisrael, true to his name and the mitzvah that he took such care in, he was happy to help this person. And that's what he did. He helped him. And the man left. And then his family members were like, what's going on? Like, we know how precious your time is. And we know how busy you are. Why did you go through such trouble to help somebody who's really not even such a nice person, the opposite of a nice person? And he said, I want to tell you a story. Um, and he said, Mashiach came. And everybody, all the nations of the world were scrambling to find a gift to bring to Mashiach. And in a certain town, the nation, the people, the, the non-Jewish people realized that the best gift they could possibly bring to Mashiach is a Jew. That's what Mashiach wants. Mashiach wants to collect all the Yidin from around the world. So they were looking high and low for a Jew. And they couldn't find any Jewish people because they had banished them from their town. And they looked and they looked and they looked and finally they found one person who actually had, who was, who converted to Christianity and, you know, was part of campaigns against the Jewish community, but he still was a Jew. And this person who was hiding when Mashiach came, they found him, 
They dragged him out of his hiding place, kicking and screaming, and they brought him to Mashiach. And that was one of the most precious gifts that, um, that they brought to Mashiach. That was his, his story, his way of explaining the preciousness of, of a Yiddish and a Shama. And it's actually based on, on a Pasuk, which I don't remember. <laughs> But the Pasuk says that Taka, when Mashiach comes, the nations of the world are going to want to bring a present to Mashiach and they're going to bring Jewish people as their presence. And the reason why I'm sharing the story, even though it's a little bit strange and unusual, but here we see a tzaddik who went through such lengths, who took so much trouble just to help a person who many would say... Do, you know, for sure he was not the type of person who would ever return the favor, that's for sure. But not only that, he was, a, he was a person who took pleasure in hurting other people. And it just highlights the awesomeness and the preciousness of every soul, each and every Yiddish and Hashemah, no matter what a person did, and no matter, you know, no matter, no matter who they are on the outside, on the inside, they're, very, they're still very pre precious. And it's not just the inside that's very precious, their whole self is very precious. And it's beyond our comprehension to appreciate the beauty of a Yiddish and a Shama. We cannot even wrap our minds around it, but we can try. And I think it's important to try because it makes all the difference to how we go about our lives. We can go about, we can go through lives like a shmata, engaging in our lives as if we are a shmata. We can look at ourselves as victims of circumstances, identify ourselves by whatever identity society imposed upon us or people imposed upon us or situations beyond our control um, get, have, have given us. We could be helpless. We could be stuck in our misery and resentment and despair. And, and that's one way of going through life. Or we could experience the depth and the value and the beauty of who we really are on the inside. We could experience Hashem's empowerment of us. And with that, we could go through life carrying His light and being carried by that light, by that beautiful, radiant, glorious, unstoppable empowerment. And with that, we will have such inner peace and we'll be limited by nothing but our own choices. So having a strong sense of identity makes really, to, to, you know, from my perspective at least, it makes all the difference to how we live. If we're gonna live with energy, dignity, empowerment, or we're going to live with disempowerment, shame, and a sense of worthlessness and helplessness. But hey, right? The topic of tonight is Rosh Hashanah. Why are we talking about this? It's supposed to be about tshuva, right? And you might ask, how does this all fit in here and now? So this mimer that we're going to learn tonight of the Balatanya is not about, officially, the topic is not about, you know, it's not about our neshama. The topic is about teshuva. That's the topic of the night. Um, and that's, it was actually said on Shabbos Shuvah. This was a Shabbos Shuvah mimer. So it's, it has to do with tshuva, but it's all about who we are. It's all about the value of our neshama. So let's learn it and we'll see how it all connects. What we're gonna do is something that we haven't done before here. We're gonna read a lot of it inside. I'm gonna translate every word, but if you have the text, um, um, you'll, you'll enjoy following along. If not, you'll still, if you're, whatever, if you're walking, if you're doing your dishes, whatever you're doing, you'll still be able to benefit just by hearing. We're gonna, um, the reason why I wanna do most of it inside is because so many times we do it outside of the text and, I, and this text is so smooth and, really so clear and so direct that we're gonna do most of it inside. Okay, so there's a Pasuk that we say, it's in Tehillim, Parakuf Lamed. By the way, um, on the text you'll see on the right side or on the left side, any Pesukim that are quoted in the text on the right side or the left side, whichever, you'll see that it alternates, you see the source of where that Pasuk is. So that was done by Chassidus, the team at Chassidus Muvaris. It's a very helpful tool. Okay, Shira Mailis Mimamakim Kerasicha Hashem. The simple meaning of these words is Mimamakim from the depths. We are calling out from the depths of our pain, we're calling out to Hashem. That's generally what how people translate this 
these words. We think that it means, right? It's, I'm sorry, one second. We're calling out to Hashem from the pits, from the depths of our pain, from the depths of our suffering. And the deeper meaning is that the word ma'amakim, ma'amakim is very telling. It's translated, we typically translate it as depths, like the deep places. But the ideal word for depth would be omek, or oimek, right? Or oimkim. Ma'amakim implies, it's not just oimek, it's not the depth, it's ma'amakim, it's the act of creating depth. It's the act of digging, reaching for the depths. So as we say these words during the entire Sarasim Tshuva, beginning from Rosh Hashanah, what we're saying is that Mima Makim, from this place, from this state of being, and what's the state of being? We are digging, we are engaging, we, we're in that state of being, we're digging deep within ourselves. And from that depth of our souls, that's where we are engaging in our relationship with Hashem. That's where we're calling out to Him. We read these words during Aser, every day during Aser Simechuva because they represent the essence of what this time is about. Let's read. I'm going to go back inside. So, Shir HaMailas Mi Ma'amakim Kerasicha Hashem. Right? Shir HaMailas, a song of ascents. From the depths I call out to you, Hashem. Mi Ma'amakim. The word Mi Ma'amakim actually means Hu Lashayn. It's a, it's, a, it's a language that means I am digging, I'm creating a depth. Misham kurasicha Hashem, from the act of digging, from that state of being where I am digging deep within my soul, while I'm digging deep within our, my soul, that's where I'm calling out to Hashem from. The who nitkan, leimar baser simechuvan, or I forgot, I forgot to check exactly how to read those words. So that this these words we say during Aser Simechuva. Why? Ki b'chol hashana ha'adam haylech achar shiriras libay kimei shakasov ki fanu alai arif aval baser Simechuva b'chol yom v'yom kol echad v'echad niskarev el Hashem yisparech v'nis ala b'chol yom yoser 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 ad yom hakipurim v'nasim kol nishamas Yisrael im Hashem yisparech panim bepanim. Sorry that I read so many lines in order. Next time I'll do one line at a time. These words, we say them. Why do we say them during Aser Simei Tshuva? Because throughout the year, we get distracted. We get pulled in all kinds of directions, and we allow ourselves to go in all kinds of directions. And we get pulled into what I like to call otherness, that reality that denies, contradicts Hashem's presence. And we forget about Hashem. It's like we, to, we turn our backs on, our, on Hashem. But during Aser Simei Tshuva, Every single day, each and every one of us is brought closer to Hashem. And this elevates, like this first, the first Rosh Hashanah is one level. The day after Rosh Hashanah, we, we, we are brought even closer to Hashem. And the next day, we're brought even closer to Hashem. And this peaks on Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur, we are face to face before Hashem. So what does it mean, by the way, when the Baal Tanya is talking about face-to-face, he says, the idea of facing Hashem with our face means that we have a desire. We have pleasure. It's not like, you know, fine. And, that's, and by the way, this is why teshuva is appropriate for even for, for every single person. Because, you know, we do a mitzvah, we do it by rote. It's meaningless compared to doing it in a way of face-to-face. It's like, you know, you have a gift. Your kid asks you for something and you're kind of like, okay, take it, fine, goodbye. You know, I don't, compare that where your kid asks you for something and you look into their eyes and your eyes lock. And you say, here, take it with a smile. It's a whole different experience. It's a whole different kind of giving. So in our relationship throughout the year, it's as if we turn our back on Hashem. You can't run away from Hashem. He's always with you. But we could turn our back on him. During Aser Simechuva, it's as if we're coming face to face with Hashem. And, and this is because of our desire is awakened. And we desire to come closer. We want to come face to face with Hashem. Now, all that, very nice. We're coming face to face with Hashem. Beautiful. But that still doesn't explain the word ma'amakim. 
it still doesn't explain how does that connect to the depth, the mamakim of our soul. So now the Baal Tanya asks, so if we're talking about the depths of our soul, we just said, very nice, we're going to be face to face with Hashem, but that still doesn't answer the depths. So what is the depths? If we're talking about Mima Makim, and this is the Avaida of Aser Simei to relate, to engage in our relationship from the place, from that deep place inside of ourselves, what is that deep place inside of ourselves? And here's where the Baal Tanya goes into an elaboration and an exploration of what is a neshama? What is that, what I call our awesome self? So, for those of you who are joining now, we are on line seven on the text. Let's understand what is the idea of neshama Yisrael? What is your soul all about? If these days beginning on Rosh Hashanah and culminating on Yom Kippur, are all about engaging in our relationship from the depths of our soul. So what is that place? What is that space inside of us that we're trying to access as we dig deeper? So first of all, Tanya is going to tell us what it's not. It's not as people think. He says, I'm on line seven. It's not what the world thinks. It's not just an intellectual energy that's in every person that enables a person to understand Hashem. Just like, it's not intellectual capacity that, that allows us to understand Hashem, and, it's, and with that, it's comparable to other parts of our intellect that, with which we understand other ideas and other people, right? So that's not the essence. That's not the mamakim. That's not the depth of what a neshama is about. What is a neshama about? Ki a neshama he, a neshama is chelek aleka mima'al. It's an actual part of Hashem. Shahula ma'ala me'asechel. Just as Hashem, shahula ma'ala me'asechel, I mean, just as Hashem is above our understanding. Hashem is impossible to comprehend because he is infinite. How could a finite being comprehend what is infinite? We can't. We can't wrap our, but we could understand as much as Hashem allows, of, of, allows us to understand. It's so great, it's indescribable. Hashem is beyond us. So too, the greatness of our neshama is also beyond our comprehension. I just want to add, that there's a famous mushal of the Baal Shem Tov that we're all familiar with. Yesterday was the Baal Shem Tov's birthday. So the Baal Shem Tov said that every Yid is beloved to Hashem like an only child born to, elder, to elderly parents, like to parents in their old age after waiting for so many years. That's a tremendous amount of love, right? An anticipation that has been building up for so many years, and now they have this child the love that they have. You know what the Lubavitcher Rebbe says about that? The Lubavitcher Rebbe says that doesn't even describe the love. It's just that in, human, in the human experience, we can't, that's, that's, that's the greatest love that the Baal Tanya was able, to, that the Baal Shem Tov was able to compare it to. But that doesn't describe the love because the actual love is incomprehensible. And that's what the Baal Tanya says here. The value, the greatness, the respectability, the worthiness, the dignity, the preciousness of a Yiddish and a Shama is We cannot even comprehend it. So now, if our neshama is beyond our intellect, what are we ma mocking? What, what's the ma mocking? How are we, what do you mean we're digging to access it? If it's beyond us, why are we digging? Like, how are we even trying to touch us? What, how can we even relate to it? What are we trying to experience as we try to touch and reach and dig into our souls and touch that deep place inside of us? What is it that we're trying to do? So now the Baal is going to take a detour. And I considered skipping this part because it's a little bit complex, but I'm going to ask you to bear with me. I think that it's just going to 
upgrade your experience, enrich your ex uh, appreciation for what an ashama is. It's just a couple of lines, but we'll, let's do it. So he starts by explaining that there are two different dimensions of our neshama, and each one is hinted at in the two different names that we are called. We're called Yaakov, and we are called Yisrael. And these two names, Yaakov and Yisrael, are two different aspects of our neshama. Let's read that line inside. It is line number 10. Acha inyan. There are two aspects of our neshama, two totally different dimensions, Yaakov and Yisrael. Um, B'nai Yisrael, we as Jewish people, sometimes we're referred to as B'nai Yaakov, right? Everybody here knows Beis Yaakov, L'chuv um, you know, Hashem said to speak to Beis Yaakov, Vesagid L'b'nai Yisrael. So Yaakov is a name that we're called, Al-Tira Avdi Yaakov, Hashem calls us Yaakov, even though Hashem changed his name to Yisrael. So Yaakov is a name, and Yisrael is a name. These two parts of us are real. Now, in order to appreciate what each of these dimensions are, we're going to take another detour. <laughs> this is a little of an intellectual journey, but we're going to come to a place of understanding our neshama, so it's worthwhile. <laughs> we're going to preface this by understanding two different forms of Hashem's light. Okay, v'naktim, in order to appreciate these two names, we're first going to explore two different ways in which Hashem's light is manifest in this world, and we'll preface this by taking a closer look at a Pasuk. In Yeshaya Hanavi, um, Hashem says, the heavens are my seat and the earth is my footstool. That's line number 11, v'naktim. We're gonna preface this by first understanding the Pasuk that says, Hashemayim kisi, the earth, the heavens are my seat. V'ha'aretz ha'dayim ragli, and the, and, the, and the earth is my footstool. Mahu ha'dayim ragli. What is this, I, what does it mean that there's a footstool? Obviously, it means that there's a lower level and of, of godliness, uh, uh, Right? There's a lower level, lower level of Hashem's exposure. This Pasuk is telling us that there's a huge difference in the way that Hashem is exposed in the heavens and the way that Hashem is present on earth. That's what it seems to be saying. So how could this be? Right? How could this be? Because, one second. Before we ask how could this be, what is that difference? What is that difference? In the heavens, the malachim experience Hashem with absolute perfect clarity. They are, therefore, because they experience Hashem with absolute clarity, they're in a constant state of awe. They recognize, it's like when you stand before something, you see it, you believe it naturally, and you, you're in that atmosphere, you're in that energy, you're in that flow, automatically. So the malachim experience Hashem with perfect clarity, and therefore they're in a constant state of awe, and they never have any thoughts, certainly not any beliefs that contradict Hashem's truth at all. They constantly are aligned with Hashem's presence. By contrast, on earth, in our physical world, Hashem's presence is hidden. Hashem's presence is not revealed. And as a result, we do have thoughts and ideas and beliefs that contradict Hashem's truth, and we have this all the time. Okay, let's read that line inside. Line 13, va'emes kahu, this is how it is, this is the truth. Shemalachem el yainem oindim tamid be'ema ve'yira belisho machshav azares. Klaam. The angels in the heavens are in a constant state of awe because they experience Hashem in a revealed way, and they never have any ideas, certainly not behaviors, that are not perfectly aligned with Hashem's truth. Why? Because they constantly experience Hashem in a revealed way. But on this earth, in our world, in our reality, Hashem is not revealed. Now, this begs a question. How could it be that Hashem is experienced in such completely different ways in heaven and on earth. When there's a Pasuk in Malachi, 
we are told, Hashem says, I am Hashem and I have never changed. Changed. Ani Hashem, loy shanisi. I never changed. So if Hashem never changed, how could it be that Hashem is so different in the heavens and in the earth? Right? Ulechayra hutu, I'm on line 15. Sharei nemar ani havaya loy shanisi. How could this be? The short answer, the answer is explained in the Zayhar. The short answer is that Hashem exists in exactly the same way everywhere in every dimension of reality. That's Hashem's, Hashem exists equally in every single space. Hashem, where is there a difference? Hashem created different beings and different worlds, and there are differences in how different creations experience Hashem. So Hashem is the same, but how we experience Hashem on earth is different from how the angels experience Hashem in the heavens. And how we experience Hashem in this world is different to how, let's say, a sheep experiences Hashem or a tree experiences Hashem. Every different creation and every different time zone, not time zone in Australia or in New York, but time zone meaning he heaven and earth or different aspects of heaven, experiences Hashem in different ways. Now to go through the um, answer at length, I think I'm going to, I'm going to skip a couple of lines, but I want to, I want to, um, I want to share it orally, okay? So there's two different types of Hashem's light that we experience, okay? And stay tuned as you hear these two different forms of light. Don't tune out. <laughs> these two different forms of light are also how we experience the part of Hashem, the light of Hashem within us. So first, the Baal Tanya goes, uh, you know, explains these two different types of light and how we experience them in the world at large. And then the Baal Tanya is going to turn it inward and tell us how we experience these types of light within us. And they're going to be the difference between the name Yaakov and Yisrael. So I'm going to back, I'm going to try to do this briefly and then we'll go, we'll go back inside the text. So there are two different forms of light, uh, Hashem's light that we experience. These two are known as Soivev Kal Almin. Soivev is from a surrounding, transcending, encompassing, and Mimale Kal Almin, filling. Now, a lot of times I used to think, before I learned this properly, I thought that Mimale means it fills up, and Soivev means it doesn't enter. And that's not the correct um, understanding of these words. So for those of you who have heard these words before, it's a list, listen out here. Both of these two forms of light are equally present in the world. The difference is how we experience it. Memale Kalaman is a kind of light that Hashem contracts himself, con can restricts himself, makes himself small so that we could experience it in a tangible way. Whereas Saivev is so holy and so deep that it's, we, we can't experience it in a tangible way. It, we can only experience it subconsciously. So Memale is something, is a kind of Hashem's light that we could absorb, we could experience, we could touch it. Hashem makes it relatable to us. And Saivev is beyond our comprehension. We can't wrap, literally, we can't wrap our minds around it. It wraps us. We can't wrap our minds around it because it's so deep. It's so pure. It's so holy. It doesn't mean that it's not present, and it doesn't mean that it's not having an impact on us. But here's, an under, oh, here's a way that I thought of a good muscle, and I, I didn't think of it myself. I saw it in a different part of Hasidus Muvo Eres. I couldn't identify exactly where. It was not in this mimer, but I saw it somewhere else. Um, and to understand this better, we can look at um, how our neshama, our own life force, fills our bodies. Because in our bodies, we also have the way our neshama fills up our bodies is also in these two, in these two ways. 
We have the mamale kol almon in our bodies, and we have the seviv kol almon in our bodies. So what is it? The seviv kind of light is inherently transcendent. It's not something we could put our fingers on. It's the fact of our life force. And then we have the mamale kol almon kind of light that's possible to absorb and experience. For example, the mamale kol almon, because it fills up, it's possible to absorb, that kind of energy is unique to different parts of our bodies. So let's say the mamale kol almon kind of energy comes from our minds, the seat of our neshama is in our minds, and every part of our body has a different kind of mamale kol almon energy. Our fingers have one kind of energy. Our knees have a different kind of energy. Our hair follicles, this is not my real hair, just saying. <laughs> Our hair follicles have a different kind of energy. Our toenails have a different kind of energy. Every part of our body has a different kind of energy and function and enables our bodies to function in different ways so that our knees can help us walk and carry ourselves, but our knees cannot draw a painting or type on our keyboard. But our fingers can hold up our bodies, but our fingers could type and draw and write and do all kinds of different things. So the fact there's different kinds of energy, right? There's different energy. When I look at my fingers and they're moving, what I'm seeing is the energy of my soul, God's empowerment of me, is enabling me to move my fingers. And that's a specific kind of energy. It could, I could see it, I could feel it, I could touch it, right? There's, there's another way to understand this is like, you know, um, if, if we get, a, if there are certain parts of our bodies, our toenails and our hair, we could cut our hair without it causing any pain because there's very little energy in our hair. There's certain sensitivity in it, but there's not, it doesn't hurt to cut it. It doesn't hurt to cut our nails unless you're a two-year-old and your mother's cutting your nails <laughs> and you're afraid that she's also gonna touch your skin. But there's really, it doesn't touch it. And then other parts of our bodies are extremely sensitive to touch because those parts of our bodies have a higher level of energy. So there's different levels of ability, different energies, right? And in each of them, from the perspective, this is the perspective of Mamale. We experience different types of energy, different types of abilities in different parts of our bodies. That's Mamale Kalaman. And that's the idea of how we experience Hashem in the world. In this world, we experience Hashem in a very limited way. Angels in the heavens experience Hashem in their way because that's their form of mamale. Does that, could you nod? Because I'm looking at everybody, but I, does that, is that, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so that's mamale. When I move my finger, I see Hashem's light is moving my finger. Which kind of Hashem's light is helping, empowering me to move my finger? Mamale kalam. Right, and I could come to know it by looking, wow, my hand is moving, Hashem is giving me life. That's the mamali column, because my fingers move differently than my toes. By contrast, the arha saivig, the encompassing transcendent light, is also present. It's equally present in, my, in every single part of our bodies, but we don't see it. We feel that we're alive, but we cannot identify any measurements. We can't say, here is where it begins and here is where it ends. I could say about the mamale, this is the function of my fingers, and that's not the function of my fingers. It has a beginning and an end. There is, there's, a, there's a definitive measure to it. By contrast, the saving koalim part of energy in our bodies, you can't define it. You can't say, oh, this is what it's making you do. It's indefinable. It's so deep. It's life itself. It's the essence of life itself. And that's why it's, it's, it's above any measurements, any categorization, any, any differentiation whatsoever. It's that deep. It's just the source, the, the deep, the depth of our, of our life itself. And that's why when we say, chas oh, that person, she walked in half dead, you know? Chas v'shalom, right? We're, when we, first of all, there's no such thing, really. We don't really mean it. What we might mean by that is that chas v'shalom, Half of that body's, that person's bodily functions are dysfunctional. They're not working. That's what we mean. But from the perspective of soive, which is the infinite light, the light that cannot be measured in numbers, there's no such thing as half dead chas or 75% alive. 
A person is either alive or not alive. And anybody who's been in a hospital with somebody in their last moments knows there's a specific point in time when the soul leaves the body, right? And, and anyone who's experienced any loss, even somebody who's very ill, even somebody who lost their memory and maybe is not really relatable, but the fact that they're alive is, is a lot, they're alive, they're present, we have them with us. It's a whole different story when they're not alive anymore. So what is it? It's not their bodily functions. It's something deeper. It's the preciousness of life itself. And the essence of life, this Arha Soivev, this Soivev Kol Amun kind of light is not about bodily function. It's deeper than bodily function. And that's why the sacredness of life is never, in Jewish law, it's never about bodily function because there's a light of the essence of the energy of life is not about bodily function. It's just a life. It's just the, the, it's just the life itself. And it's there, the, sacred, the sacredness and the preciousness of life is beyond anything we do or don't do. It's there in the same measure in every part of our body as long as we're alive. Okay, so now, based on that, now we could understand, you know, I think because we did this, we actually, I did do this in, in depth, even though I said I would skip it, <laughs> but I did do that in depth. We may as well read this inside because it's only two lines actually inside. Um, let's do it inside. We asked a question and we said, how could it be that Hashem is different? Hashem says, I'm never different. I never changed. I didn't change before creation. I didn't change after creation. And we know that on heaven, in, in the heavens, the angels have one kind of experience. And on earth, we have a different kind of experience. So how does that reconcile with the fact that Hashem himself is unchanged? Now we can understand that. So here, um, line number 16. Number 16, achatir, it's the answer, alzeh, for this is, tehine yesh beis bechinas, there's two types of Hashem's light. Soyvev kol almen, the transcendent, encompassing light, omen male kol almen, the light that is absorbed, that fills up. Vehine bevchina soyvev kol almen, ein shum shino, kaidem abriel achrebriel. This soyvev kol almen, the essence of God himself, the infinite light of Hashem that's beyond any measure, beyond any categorization or differentiation, the essence of Hashem's light, nothing changed before creation and after creation. Sorry. And Hashem is present in every inch of the world, in the heavens and the earth, in exactly the same way. Beshava, equally. Line 18, ki ego, like a like a circle, Shemes Agel Umesavev Aflamata, a circle that encircles and encompasses and surrounds above and below. This light of Hashem is above our intellect, it's above time. Haya Haya past, present, and future. Berega Echad are as one. She'ein Hasechel Masig that our minds cannot comprehend this. Infinity. It's inf Hashem is infinite, and we can't comprehend it. So where is there a change? There's a change in how we experience Hashem's light. Amnam hashine, I'm on line 20. Hashine, hu b'vchines memalikal amun. Dehine, basar mamares nivra elam. Hashem created the world with 10 utterances. Shen ishtal shalu maimar yihi ar vayihi chen, yihi rakia vayihi chen. As Hashem said, let there be light, and there became light. So now, that's, that was, what was that? That was memale kol amun. That was a specific energy that's creating light and our experience of light. The difference is only in how we receive the light. Every world, that means the heavenly worlds and the physical world, experiences godliness. On, in our unique, specific way. And that's what, it, that's what we mean when we say, V'zehu hashamayim kisi. Now we can understand the difference in the Pasuk when it says, the heavens are my seat, and that refers to the heavens. Masigim yaiser elikus. They understand God 
more deeply, more, more wholesomely because they have no distractions. They don't experience any hiddenness of God. Um, and the earth is my footstone. This is a lower level of exposure of godliness, not a lower level of Hashem's presence. Hashem is equally present, but His light is less revealed. And we cannot comprehend Hashem and His exclusive power and the infinity and the beauty and the, and, and, and the love of Hashem. We cannot comprehend it in our world because he's hidden. Okay, all that was an introduction to understanding our souls. And ay, 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 ay. I took too much time to explain that. Okay, sorry. Let's just keep, I'm not gonna look at the clock. We'll just keep going until it's time to stop. Okay, Vahine, I'm gonna do Parak Shani on page two, line one. Remember we said that just like we said that, um, okay, just like the light of Hashem is different in the world at large, so too the way we experience our neshama is different, okay? What I was talking about before is life force. Now we're going to see, now we're going to see it in a different way. Just like they're in two, there's two different forms of energy of Hashem's light. The soivev, the encompassing, the transcendent light, and the memale kol the one, the kind of light that fills and is absorbed. K'moi kein b'neshama sa'adam, yesh gam kein be'ez b'chines elu. In our souls, we also have these two concepts, these two different types of light. Valzeh nemar, and Hashem uses in Parshas Bereshis when it talks about the creation of man, where man also means woman, because, you know, Hashem created them as one. So when Hashem created us, it, there, there's two times that Hashem mentions the words Tzalem. One, it says, Vayivra Sa'adam B'Tzalmai, and a different time it says Bitzelem Elikim. And these two, Bitzalmai and Bitzelem, are the two different forms of light. Bitzalmai, it's still connected to Hashem, that represents the Soivev Kal Amen, the incomprehensible, the transcendent light that's immeasurable. It's beyond any type of categorization. It can't fit into our minds. It's so precious so infinite, so beautiful, that it cannot even be described in words. And that's why it's called Bitzal Moi, in Hashem's image. I once heard a beautiful vert. Um, I don't remember where this is from, but it's so beautiful and it fits in right here. It says, God has no image. How could it tell us, how could the Pusik tell us we were created in God's image? What kind of image does God have? What, co what color eyes? What color, what kind of nose, what kind of mouth? He has no image. What do I mean we were created in God's image? And that's exactly just as God is imageless beyond, you cannot limit Hashem to a specific color, to a specific line, to a, to a specific shape, to any definition, so too our souls are indefinable. There's no predefined image. It's up to us to create our image. So Bitsalmai represents that essential light of God that is indefinable. It's essentially indefinable because it's infinite. How could infinity be defined? And then Bitsalam Elikim, it's already Elikim. Let's read it inside. Vizel Inyan, does it say it's Elikim, what Elikim means here? No. Okay. Elikim is. Um, the, the name Elikim is, we know, Gematria HaTeva represents nature. And Betel Melikim means, it refers to the kind of light that is Mimalekalam, that is comprehensible. That's more tangible, that Hashem constricts and contracts and, and, and makes relatable. And that's uh, also a part of our Neshama. And now the Baal Tanya says, that's why... Each and every one of us is called by two names. We are both Yaakov and we're Yisrael. 
Bechinas Yaakov, I'm on line number four. Yud Ekev. Hu Chachma. Yud, we know in, according to the Zayhar, the Zayhar tells us that the letter Yud represents wisdom. That essential wisdom. Wisdom, by definition, is something, it's a, it's a power. It's a power to understand God. So Yud Ekev, Yud, and Ekev means the heel. So the name Yaakov represents that part of our neshama that we could comprehend. And that's the part of our neshama that could comprehend godliness. Umasha Meir, Umachaya Esaguf Beramach Evarim, Hurak Ekev Mina Neshama, that we experience that energy, that life force, as we move our bodies, what we're experiencing is the Yaakov part of, of our neshama. It's comprehensible. It's relatable. It's tangible. It's something that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Bechinas ragle ha-neshama. That's like the, and that's the akev. It's like the heels, the foot, the bottom level of our neshama. And then we also have a Yisrael part of our neshama. Yisrael who li roish. I know we, we learned that Yisrael is sarkel. This is a different meaning. Yisrael also comes from the words li roish. It means Hashem's head. Hashem's head is essentially li roish, meaning my head. To the, the head is to me, meaning it's beyond our comprehension. This is a part of our neshama that our bodies and our intellect cannot possibly grasp because it is so holy, so deep, so precious, and it's so infinite. It's an actual part of Hashem. Uvechina zu, this is my favorite lines. Uvechina zu hu echad yachid umiyuchad. It's one and it's united and it miyuchad. It's like, how, how do we say? It's intertwined, completely one. Im Hashem is Barach, Belishum Pirud Bishum Eifin. It's 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 one with Hashem. It's inseparable, ever, unconditionally, eternally, infinitely one with Hashem and inseparable, ever. There's nothing like in the story that we said in the beginning. So he did some wrong things. He made many mistakes. That guy, but the Israel was still there. Totally active, totally present, inseparable, inseparable ever from God. No matter what anyone ever did, no matter what anything, no matter what was done to us, we're one with Hashem. Each and every one of us has this. No matter, even people who think that Torah is nothing. Even people who make light of Torah. We know that sometimes it says there's certain averis that a person does that we say they're cut off, Rahman al Islam, from Hashem Chas v'shalom. What does that mean? How does that, if they're cut off, how are they inseparable? And he says that that is about the Yaakov dimension. That means that this person is removing themselves from the from their life force that is comprehensible, that they can feel, that they can touch. They're removing themselves away. But the Yisrael part, the la- I'm on line 10 of page 2, of Abachinas Yisrael, Eina nefredes mimenu yisbech b'shum oifet. No matter what, no matter when, no matter where, no matter how, no matter what, nothing, nothing can separate us from complete unity with Hashem. And... Now we have another question. If, if we're saying that the Yisrael part of our neshama is inseparable from Hashem, and our bond with Hashem is in, unbreakable because we are, we're, we're intertwined, like in, infinitely. So how could, now we have a question. It says, in Hosea, Shuva Yisrael, and this is what we say on Shabbos Shuva. We're going to say this. Um, in the, on the Shabbos when we're doing tshuva during our series of tshuva, tshuva Yisrael ad Hashem alekecha. Return Yisrael to Hashem, your God, your power. How could this be? 
We just said that Yisrael never needs to return. Yisrael never went away. Yisrael can never be broken. Yisrael can never be detached. So what's this business of Yisrael needing to do tshuva? Why does Yisrael need, how could it be that Yisrael needs to do tshuva? Ulechayra hu tmua, I'm going to continue reading page um, number 11. Ulechayra hu tmua, Yisrael machata. How could Yisrael do an avera? Vahaloi eina nefredes umatzarach tshuva. never separates from Hashem, so why does it need to do tshuva? How could it return if it never separated? The word tshuva means return. You could only return if you leave. But we cannot leave. The Yisrael never leaves Hashem. So what does it mean that we need to return? And he goes on to explain that when we do an Avera, I'm not going to read these because I want to get to the Shema part. And then we'll stop. Okay. Um, when we do an Avera, it's like a person, where do you trip? If you, if you trip over a stone, what happens? You trip over a stone, nothing happened. But if you fall and you trip over a stone, what your head doesn't fall. But because you fall, because your feet fall, your head is going to be brought down with you. And what he explains is that it's true that Yisrael cannot be broken. But when we do, when we separate ourselves from Hashem, when we do, when we are disaligned from Hashem's will, when we remove ourselves and we decide, you know, we attribute power to other things and to other, and we define ourselves by other ideas and by other parts of ourselves and we belittle Hashem's presence and all that, we're turning our back on Hashem. We're devaluing our neshama and devaluing His will for us, we're not doing mitzvahs, we're doing averis, whatever. Then, and the, he uses an example, even like, we have the opportunity to give tzedakah and we don't give tzedakah. We have the opportunity to do kindness and we don't do kindness. It's as simple as that and as little as that. What happens is, it's, I'm going to read the last line, number 19. Machmazeh, because of this, noifel haneshama bechinas Yisrael litzad acher, it's not that the Yisrael is separated from Hashem. The Yisrael is never separated from Hashem. Even when we do a vera, it's never separated from Hashem. But it's like we put it off to the side. And the, bo- the bottom line is the last three words, we don't feel it. We don't feel its light. It's like we put a barrier between us and Hashem. It's not that the neshama is disconnected. The Israel is not disconnected. But we are not able to experience its light. It's as if we pushed it off to the side and put a barrier in between. And for this, we need to do tshuva. What does it mean to do tshuva? We, later on, he's going to explain. It means to return to our soul. To return our soul to a place of awareness to a place where its light can radiate within every part of our bodies, within our conscious selves. Because even as we can't experience, we, we, we were saying the whole time that this light of Hashem is so transcendent, we can't touch it, but, obvious, but, but it has an impact on us and it's present. So we could feel its presence even though we don't have the proper words for it. But when we disconnect from Hashem, it's not lighting, it's not radiating, it's not flowing. The light is not flowing into our bodies. And for this, we need to do tshuva. Later on, it's going to explain that we need to return to ourselves. It's not even about returning to Hashem. Of course, it's about returning to Hashem. But we need to return to ourselves. I want to leave you with one more little meditation. Um, and then we'll continue next week. Um, more about the neshama. I'm going to continue on line 20. Now, with this, we can appreciate the meaning of the words that we say every day, Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echad. This is the most, this is beautiful, okay? L'chaira, lama nemar gimel shemas. Why do we need to say Hashem's name three times? We could have said, Shema Yisrael, listen Yisrael, Hashem Elikeinu. Hashem is our God. And Echad, He is one. 
Or we could have said, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Echad. Why are we saying Hashem Alekeinu and Hashem Echad? So many words. And he says, because there is a deeper meaning in this line. And because every one of us these days, I think if you say this, every, if you say Shema every day, this is a beautiful meditation to take away from tonight's learning. The meaning is this. Shema is from the word understanding. Tune in. Listen and absorb in your minds. Yisrael, we just said. Yisrael means that part of our neshama that's called Yisrael, which is the deepest part of our neshama, the part of our neshama that's untouchable, indefinable, unbreakable, unstoppable, right? The chal echad, sarach leimar l'neshama. Each and every one of us should tell this to ourselves every single day. Shema, v'havein, listen, tell this to yourself, okay? This is the, 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 the prescription of the Baal Tanya for these days. I love it. Shema v'havein, listen, understand. Ata Yisrael, you are a Yisrael. And, and remember what he said before about Yisrael. You carry Hashem's light that is unstoppable, indefinable, beyond any kind of categorization, beyond comprehension, infinite, beautiful, precious, beyond words. That's who you are. So tell this to yourself every day. Shema, listen, take it in. Ata Yisrael. You're a Yisrael. That's who you are. Unstoppable, infinite, beyond description, limited by nothing but our own choices. Bechinas HaNeshama, that's our Neshama. And because we're Yisrael, Hashem Elekeinu. What does it mean, Hashem Elekeinu? Havaya, the name Hashem, Yud Ke Vav Ke. Havaya is the name of Hashem, Shehu Perush, Haya Hayve Viyya Berega Echad. The name Havaya means, the meaning of it is that past, present, and future is in one space, in one instant, in one, wrapped up in one. Because Hashem is infinite, so time and space take up no space. He's beyond time, beyond space. You hear this? My dear friends, this is so... So <laughs> that's why it's telling us to this in one word. Shema, listen. Ata Yisrael, you're Yisrael. And because you're a Yisrael, Havaya, this infinite light, past, present, future, indefinable by time, not limited by space, by time, anything, this power, this energy, look at the line 24, the last words, Hu'alekeinu, this is our power. This is what powers us. This is, you know, on the bottom of a website, you might see powered by Google, by Google right? We are Powered by Haya Haivaviva, infinite God. Who will He is our power, meaning Kaychenu Vechayusenu. Kayach is our energy, our power. Chayusenu, our life force. Now, in case you might think that this is very nice because we just said, Saivif Kalamim is beyond our comprehension. It's not really part of me. It's transcendent. It's in my subconscious. It's so deep within me. I can't even reach it. I can't. It. No, that's why we say at the end of Shema, lest we think that there is a separation between my body and my soul, lest we think that there's a separation between my Yisrael and me, because it's only my subconscious and because I can't really put my finger on it because it's so deep and so precious and so holy that it's immeasurable and I can't touch it and I can't see it. And I can't even put my finger on what it feels like. Lest we think that that makes it separable from us, it's not. Hashem Echad. Kuloi Kulachad, line 25. Kulachad, it's all one. It's all one. This neshama that's called Yisrael is one with Hashem. And it goes on, he goes on to say 
what happens when we meditate on this idea and when we absorb it, how we have the love that we experience and that we will explore in Mertz Hashem next week. Um, and we'll also understand why are we talking about all of this in tshuva? Like how does this all relate to, to the concept of tshuva? We're going to go into that in Mertz Hashem next week. We have here page one and two, and next week we'll get page three, and maybe it'll be also page four. Um, and now let's open, I'm gonna check the chat. I'm sorry that I wasn't looking at it the whole entire time. Oh, I don't know how to share screen with text, but Blee Nether, I will learn how to do that for next time. Okay, I don't see questions. Let me open up the chat, the, okay, let's do this. Stopping the recording.